everyone. Thank you very much for joining us at this Pearl of the Islands Foundation event covering human rights, racial discrimination and related intolerance in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I want to thank the Pearl of the Islands Foundation, which I serve on uh, their advisory board for their initiative in setting up this forum to enable us to discuss a hugely timely and, of course, vitally important subject. And tonight we're honoured to have a number of key speakers joining us tonight. We have Dr. Arama Rata from the University of Waikato, and she is a senior research fellow at the National Institute of Demographic and Economic Analysis at that university where she specialises on iwi connectedness, Māori voting, Māori migrant relations and settler colonial racialization. <laughs> a huge field to cover, Arama, um, and couldn't be more pertinent. Um, <clears throat> Ming Fun, we're honoured to have you tonight. Ming is the Race Relations Commissioner which is a responsibility he's taken up after 24 years at the Gisborne District Council. Um, I understand that you're responsible for leading the work of the Human Rights Commission in promoting positive race relations. And we are so grateful that you were able to join us tonight. You've just come from a meeting, so thank you very much indeed. Um, from my own university campus, distinguished professor Paul Spoonley, who is continuing his research and writing on diversity and population change in New Zealand, just published a book called One of Many. He's authored called The New New Zealand Facing Demographic Disruption. And he's currently researching right wing and white supremacist politics. He's a fellow of the Royal Society in the Auckland New Zealand. And Gulid Mira, thank you for joining us tonight is a former refugee who's passionate about advancing and encouraging the social well-being, inclusion and development of New Zealand's ethnic and former refugee communities. Um, he serves on the boards of a number of community organizations and is the co-founder of a nonprofit called Third Culture Minds, which is dedicated to unlocking the potential of ethnic youth and improving their well-being outcomes. So thank you to our distinguished speakers for joining us tonight. I have one sub question to start off with, which is a simple one to express, complex one to actually address. And um, Dr. Rata, I wonder if we could start with you. What do you think is the biggest issue our society here in Aotearoa is facing when it comes to discrimination? That we, we've, we've talked about systemic racism in, in, in public recently a lot. What, in your opinion, is the most pressing challenge that we face in this area? Yeah, so there's lots of different forms of discrimina uh, discrimination that we could talk about um, facing different marginalised communities. Um, but, but I don't think that um, they're really separate issues that you can just pick one and say this is uh, where we should be focusing all of our attention. I think it comes down to the settler colonial structures that the country was founded on. Um, so the idea that Christians were superior to non-Christians, the idea that uh, white people were superior to um, non-white people, the idea that um, European people were, were um, superior to natives, that people were superior to the environment, that men were superior to the to, to women, and of course the marginalization of queer people that can kind of also be related to that. So I think all of these issues come down to our structures, our, our social structures, um, and they need to be radically overhauled through constitutional transformation. As they say in Parliament, I have a supplementary question for you, if I may. And one is, given that these huge issues are so deeply entwined and the structures, as you say, have been embedded in our society since settler times, 
how does one go about starting to unpick them and creating a more level playing field, reducing inequality, bringing in um, inclusiveness and the valuing of the many differences that we have in our society? Yeah, so one um, great thing that we have in Aotearoa is a document that can help guide some of this, which is called Te Tiriti o Waitangi. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if we gave full expression to Te Tiriti o Waitangi, if we, if we returned the whenua, whenua to Māori, um, those would be starting points to um, achieving the type of society that would be free of, of discrimination, um, the types mm. of discrimination that we see in society today. Kia ora, Arama. Let's turn now to Guled. I uh, want to get your perspective before we go to our other speakers. What's your view of the biggest challenging challenge, particularly bearing in mind that you yourself have come here as a refugee and we're so glad that you did, but you also work with many others who've had the same experience. What's from your perspective and I guess from theirs as well, the biggest challenge that faces us when it comes to discrimination? Um, look, I think, I think there's so many um, challenges there that it's actually quite difficult to um, put it into perspective. I think the thing about racism is, and what I've said is that for the longest time, it's actually being just difficult to even talk about. Um, just even discussing it in itself has been the biggest challenge in my view. And, and, you know, sadly, it's taken a national tragedy in when 51 members of my community mm -hmm. basically supported in their place of worship for us to start conversations. Um, you know, we know that this isn't anything new. Uh, we've been living in a state of, I guess, in denial about the very form of racism that manifests here. And, you know, the biggest right now in the context of everything that's been happening with Black Lives Matter and everything else that's been going on around the world, um, the biggest challenge, I guess, in, in addressing this fight towards racism is, is staying energized, is, is, is keeping that momentum going. Um, mm -hmm. That is something that a lot of us who have been working in the anti-racism space uh, are, are, are trying to keep going. So there's, there's, there's a lot of challenges that need to be addressed. There's different forms of racism that manifest. Um, the biggest one, of course, we have to be able to talk about, um, you know, the bigger beast, which is structural institutional racism um you know and and that is something that needs to be addressed we've seen that happening um more publicly uh, at the university of waikato um that's something that needs to be talked about more broadly and we need to stop saying unconscious bias and start stop using that as a smoke screen for that bigger beast but yeah right so you're saying that we have some very major inconvenient truths to face up to Yes, absolutely. But at the same time, um, it's, it's, it feels like it appears that, you know, it's been so difficult just talking about racism. It's taken a national tragedy for us to do that. Mm. Uh, now, keeping these conversations going are really difficult because it requires a lot of energy and momentum. Uh, there's a lot of performative, I guess, um, you know, solidarity stunts and stuff like that. But also, it's, it's no longer safe. For us um, in this current environment in this context so it's this that that in itself is some of the challenges in which we're grappling with um, you know because we just recently held um, a rally of you know where 20,000 people showed up in Wellington uh, which has been referred to as one of the most historic you know largest rallies in, in I guess in modern times and and even then you know not a lot has happened it was great that so many people came out but it's like you know driving those meaningful systems change is what we need and that has been really really difficult and that's what we need to see yeah thank you for that Gulli. can i ask you ming because it's your job to have an overview of um, race relations in this country and to intervene in um, difficult situations as you see appropriate and to promote sound and sensible policies on racism um, Good had raised the question of how do we keep the momentum going, momentum that's been stimulated by things like the Black Lives Matter movement. From your overarching perspective, 
what do you think the country needs to maintain this momentum? Look, I, I think the, um, the conversations that we're having at the present time is uh, very important. Um, once upon a time, we used to be in denial. Um, now that um, things are being exposed a little bit more, uh, we're becoming more confident in talking about it. I've, I've never heard so many conversations in the last um, year about racism itself. And actually, people are coming out of this shell. And um, from my perspective, um, it's little and often. And it's actually creating a safe environment for people to actually um, express themselves, to uh, be confident in participating in society. Um, I do love the idea of uh, New Zealand history being taught in schools. I love the idea of Matariki. I love the um, idea that um, we continue to encourage our children to participate um, in public life itself because it is that structural organisation that we need to actually put ourselves in. There's no good blaming it. We actually need to arm ourselves and make sure that we're educated, that we want to actually provide public service to our communities. And um, I've been in public service for over 30 years. And it's interesting that there's not many um, ethnic people in public service. And I remember up at on the um, Ngata, he said, for Māori to actually succeed, we actually need to have Māori in all facets of um, government, all facets of local government and business and participate in general society. And that is my hope for our country, is that we continue to purposely encourage our children to participate in the decision-making of our country, whatever level that is, whether it's local, NGO, government, business, be there and do it because um, if we don't, no one else is going to. And, sure. and, and so the very important thing now is about that education. And we don't actually teach um, um, uh, governance. Uh, we don't actually teach how people to influence in, in schools. And one of the big things at the present time we're also uh, focusing on is actually our children. 35% get bullied, so how are we going to eliminate that? And there are systems that actually work, like Kiva and a number of um, the Pacific people are learning maths. Um, they feel more confident. And, um, you know, um, we just hope that our children will be the guiding light going into the future. Maybe. Thank you very much for that. And Paul, as someone who studies these topics, do we have to think in terms of generational change? In other words, it's going to take a generation or more for some of the structural issues that we face right now to be removed, improved, whatever word you want to use. Do we have to have, while not ignoring and, and indeed addressing the issues that we face today, do we have to have kind of a long-term perspective in terms of achieving change? Yes, the simple answer to that, Chris, is yes. But if I look back and look at my own journey, I mean, I can remember back to the time in 1986 when Puauti Atatū uh, was a report on the, what was then called the Department of Social Welfare, which really bedded in the notion of institutional racism. And if you think back from 1986 through to the present, you've got to say that nearly everything has got worse rather than better. Mm. So. The, the thing that I think is most challenging is really that um, what, what Adama talked about was is the, is the core institutions of our society, particularly those that are public institutions, which should be the mechanisms by which we moderate the negative consequences of various processes. If they're not working and if they're not producing equity in some sense, then we're going to have a problem which will continue whatever we might say tonight about generational change. So there's, there's got to be some fundamental institutional change in New Zealand in order to, to get some sort of equity back into this society that we call Aotearoa. Indeed, and, and personally, I completely agree. Um, Adam, if I may come back to you, 
I, I mentioned the, the topic of whether we need to look to generational change, but we've also talked about momentum behind things like the Black Lives Matter movement, which seems to have sprung up relatively quickly and gained that kind of popular thrust that we've been talking about. Do you think that if enough people get behind these sorts of movements, we can actually get things done sooner? If there, is, if there is a leadership at a national level, ranging from people like Ming in his role, political leaders of all types across the spectrum, is this kind of a moment, perhaps the one that's been forced on us by the coronavirus and all the rest of it, where we can grasp things and make change happen much sooner? Yeah, I think um, all of the panelists have raised interesting points. Um, we're talking about the spotlight on racism that the Black Lives Matter movement has has cast, um, which which is great. But I also um, take the point that little has happened as a result of that. So while there's been attention on racism, while we can talk about racism a little bit, um, not much change has actually happened. So New Zealanders have always been very good at standing up to racism overseas, um, not so much about challenging racism that exists in Aotearoa. Um, Paul talked about needing to challenge institutional racism and it's, you know, it's, it's really appalling that if we look over at, the, at the news for the last couple of years, how many universities have had um, claims of, of racism um, yeah. against them, uh, when you would hope that an institution like a university where, where staff should feel free to talk about, um, to challenge their own institutions, and yet uh, the atmosphere, even at universities, um, is one of fear. Um, so what is it like for somebody who works in a bakery or um, a restaurant, or what is it like for... Um, somebody who provides essential services, what, what type of support do they have to challenge racism where they work? Um, when it comes to that intergenerational change, it's, um, Paul kind of mentioned how there was work done decades ago um, and how things have got worse since then. So we can't just imagine that things are just going to get better over time because there are massive global movements at the moment that are that are pushing us in the opposite direction. So just because we're talking about racism now doesn't mean that it's actually better. It could be a sign that it's worse if we look at, you know, what's happening in the US at the moment. Um, Anti-racism is being called propaganda by mm -hmm. their president. This is incredibly worrying for everyone across the world. Um, and I think this is time for New Zealand to seriously consider our relationship with the US and to disentangle ourselves from them um, because you know, the situation is really deteriorating quickly there. You've raised a couple of very interesting and pertinent points there. Um, and I thank you for that. I would like to touch on the first one and ask Ming whether you'd be willing to, to talk about it. Do you think from the, the wide range of contacts that you have with um, people interested in, affected by racism, racist attitudes in New Zealand, do you think that we are somewhat complacent about the race relations situation in this country compared to um, what's happening elsewhere, Arama mentioned the US. Do you think we have a kind of optimism bias that institutional racism, other forms of racism, are uh, for other people, less so for us? Look, um, I think there's a denial, definitely. But you know, the, 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 um, the problem with racism and discrimination, abuse, um, is so large, so large in New Zealand that I personally believe that if we can actually um, support Māori them in um, their futures in New Zealand, that we will, it will go a long way in eliminating um, racism. And because they are the tangata whenua, and we're not treating the tangata whenua in our tangata whenua whenua land um, in, in a human rights perspective. Um, there's many statistics that are so bad, but I'm very keen on um, co-design, devolution of services 
where Māori have come up and supported themselves. They've actually come up with solutions. And you have a look at the Kōhanga Reo movement, the Whare Wānanga, the universities that are Māori, Awanui Arangi, uh, Raukawa, uh, the Whare Wānanga, Aotearoa, Kura Kaupapa. They, their children and their students, they actually excel more than um, general Oraki schools. Now, the other part is actually, you know, there was a notion that we're not going to trust these Māoris with all of this treaty money, right? Now, if, you, if, we, if we just go back a few years, right now, uh, when many of the uh, iwi have settled, the success stories, the demystifying of uselessness, hopelessness, not working together, is quite the opposite. And we need to actually have those um, straight up conversations that we that Māori know actually are very um, knowledgeable in how they actually critique their future. Their future is intergenerational in our country. And this is the only intergenerational race actually because their lands and their assets are actually handed down to generations and generations and hopefully for the next million generations. And we just need to actually pick one part, and I'm saying let's focus on tangata whenua. If we can get that manaki tanga, the aroha, the kaitiiki tanga, um, all of those aspects right in Māori them, I'm sure that will permeate throughout the country. Well said. Thank you for that, Ming. I wanted to pick up on the other aspect of what Arama was saying, Gulid, and, and ask you, um, um, Arama was talking about how in the US um, anti-racist um, expressions, the articulation of an anti-racist point of view is, has been dubbed propaganda. And we know, of course, that propaganda has a highly negative connotation. Um, from your point of view, Gulid, what's your take on the way that the media is portraying issues to do with racism and discrimination and intolerance in New Zealand? Have they roughly got it right? Or are there some distortions that, as Erima said about uh, the US coverage, that should be seen by us as deeply concerning? Yeah, look, um, uh, Chris, I think the issue of uh, the media contribution Contributing towards the problem of racism is actually quite a well documented, um, and we've seen this across a range of um, disciplines and areas. Um, just look at criminal justice, for example, and the way in which um, crime is reported. Um, ethnicity is almost always used in stories concerning um, Maori and and other minority marginalized groups. Um, you know, and if it's not ethnicity, um, it at least includes their background context. For example, you know, they might mention the fact that this person was from a refugee background, um, things like that. You, it's not done in the same way. I mean, have, when's the first, have you ever seen an article that said white man arrested for stealing this? Like that never happened. Or European man or whatever. They, what do they prefer? Caucasian? Like do, we don't even see that. We don't see that. That's never, ever reported on. So um, look, we'd be aligned to ourselves and um, critique the role of the media in that space. Um, I think partly the way in which it comes down to, again, is that it goes back to structural um, barriers and which that exists. If you look at the media, the media is very white. I've been to newsrooms and honestly, I've never seen it look so homogenous in my life. And, and that in itself is, is part of the problem. Um, you know, journalists have an important role to play in telling the stories of New Zealanders. Um, and, and, and I think that in itself is we're not well represented enough um, in that space. And, and not just that, we're not in positions of, you know, senior leadership and things like that. So, of course, that's why we stupid cartoons that are like racist as hell being signed off, you know. Um, look, the very fact that I myself had very openly racist things written about me in opinion pieces in letters to the editors, like, blatantly racist calling me an outsider um that i'm an ungrateful um and that you know i should not basically be speaking out about the place so much to me and etc and so forth and not just that i mean if people want to come at me with opinions and facts that's fine no problem i'm happy to engage in a debate this isn't about i guess censoring or silencing anybody but you know it's it's when things like that and i've received apologies but you know still it's like <laughs> 
why, like, how did this happen? So how did, could somebody think that it was okay to approve something like that? So partly it comes down to an issue of representation and that in itself, as a result of that lack of representation, that, that structural barrier also exists um, in the media themselves. And they feed into this. It's about clickbaits. It's about, you know, where they can get the most, I, I, yeah, the way in which it works is kind of problematic. And, you know, what we've seen is that before um, March 15th had occurred in New Zealand, we've seen the media themselves play into that narrative that the Muslim community here are likely to pose more threat than anybody else. Um, and that that's where the focus should be. Um, they fit into the whole hijabi brides narrative, which never existed. Um, you know, and, 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 and politicians are comfortable and easy enough to get away with it because they know that the media provides appetite for that and, 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 and things like that. So before even March 15th had happened, the media didn't even know us. They really didn't even know anything about Muslims. They never wanted to talk about these discussions. They weren't interested in it, you know, um, and, and the media in itself is really powerful and important because it serves as a vehicle for creating and instilling the changes that we want to see in society. So, um, you know, it helps to shave our policy agendas um, yes. and what's the priority and what isn't. Um, media really critically needs to reflect in itself. Um, and you know, the thing that I've really struggled with is this whole concept of, I guess, um, neutrality within journalism. And I mean, I don't know how somebody like Mike Hosking can just come here and just openly spew half of the stuff he does. And this is called, I don't know, neutral journalism. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how that works because I guarantee you, like this, where is a Māori person saying that? Where are they? Because they don't exist. It's the double standards in which we uphold um, those that operate um, in those media circles as well. So there's a lot there to be unpacked about media, uh, for sure. I'd, I'd agree with you. I can recall when I started my career as a journalist, the, the value of objectivity was held in high regard and was kind of enforced, whereas now it seems long ago actually to have gone out the window Paul, I wondered if I could ask you a question. Um, knowing that you're a demographer, you look at the makeup of New Zealand society and the changes occurring in it. You've just um, recently produced a book on the new New Zealand. I wonder if you look at a city like Auckland, where you see a substantial um, population or percentage of the population that has an Asian heritage. And we're very conscious of the Māori and Pacifica population of Auckland, but we have this large Asian uh, population as well. In our talking about racism and discrimination, are we tending perhaps to ignore that fact as we look at the, the hugely important issues elsewhere in society? No, I don't think we are, Chris. And, and I would look at the, some of the online stuff that's occurred since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. And Ming will probably be able to talk about this much more authoritatively than I do. But what you can see is there that uh, in the first wave of the pandemic, Asian communities bore the brunt of a lot of anxiety and a lot of hostility mm. as being the source of the pandemic. And of course, we're talking particularly about Chinese. Unfortunately, in the second wave, it has been the Pacifica communities because mm. of their involvement in, um, in community transmission that has seen them being targeted. And sitting behind that, you've got this Islamophobic and anti-Semitic arguments about a conspiracy. And we've got a number of um, fringe conservative parties that have appeared in this election, which are quite happy to retail these sorts of conspiratorial mm. views. So I think it tends to go in waves. So you get particular waves, perhaps the ownership of New Zealand dairy farms, and you've got a moment there, the 1996 election in which a, a certain political party was built upon hostility towards immigrants and specifically Asian immigrants. So alongside the enduring and ongoing racism that's directed towards Māori, you have these other groups sharing the limelight as it were from time to time and, and being the target of, of racism. So, um, it sounds rather flippant, Chris, and it's not meant to be, but we do share our racism around. The, 
the targets mm. of our racism have been there from the very beginning. And, and, and Ming, again, is part of a community that from their very arrival in New Zealand in the 1860s faced uh, systematic and institutionalized racism and which continues to this day. So I think as a society, we do have these moments when we do target um, particular groups for a particular reason at that particular moment. Yeah. And this was true, was it not, Paul, of the Chinese community in the 19th century when the Chinese came to New Zealand and they were subjected to vile racial slurs at the time. I, I, we, we're talking about racial intolerance and it seems to be inbuilt into many people just needing some kind of trigger like a coronavirus resurgence to bring out the worst in some of us at, at, in, in any event. Um, and in particular, online. What can we do about online expressions of hate? Arima, um, what's your perspective on that? I was interested in your perspective. You're probably the best positioned to answer <laughs> that question, even though you're cheering as opposed to a, a panelist. Um, uh, in my view, um, there's a lot that needs to happen in this space. So um, firstly, I would say that our legislation needs to be tightened around hate speech and hate crime. Mm -hmm. um, there are some provisions for online um, abuse currently, but these are not very well articulated. The public are not educated on how to go about those processes. And in fact, NetSafe and the police themselves seem to be quite confused about what to do with, for example, threat, uh, threats of um, violence that uh, members of the public receive. Um, Guled probably has had experiences of that, I'm sure, in, in the work that he does. Mm. Um, so there's the need for more uh, tighter legislation, public education, and also um, funding community groups to do advocacy and victim support and the monitoring of, of not just hate crime and hate speech, but also um, non-criminal uh, the hate related or hate motivated incidents so that we can actually track this over time, monitor it, um, see where it's happening and um, prevent it before it occurs. Mm. I've personally encountered some of that. Um, I've had spent quite a bit of time in the Middle East and in uh, Pakistan and saw not long ago a picture posted on Facebook, for, um, obviously from an Islamic setting, and the caption posted with it was, would certainly fit my definition of hate speech, and I decided to block that person. But Paul... If I could come back to you just for a minute, you study things like this. What's the definition of hate speech? Because it seems to be a label tossed around quite a bit without too much clarity in the public discourse about it. Yes, and I, I think it's often um, put as a dichotomy. On one side, you've got free speech, and on the other side, you've got hate speech. And to pick up Adam's point, if we're going to regulate hate speech, then somehow that's seen as denying free speech. Um, and, and I just think that's that's the wrong characterization. When we're talking about hate speech, I think there are various elements that we need to see before we can label it hate speech. One is a hostility and often anger and um, violence directed at a particular group. So there's an intent there. Um, then it needs to be communicated. So how, how is that communicated? So one of the big issues that we've got, I think, Chris, is the failure of online platforms to accept that they are publishers. So they mm. step back and say, not me. Um, and they do do some stuff, but they, they tend to, to absolve themselves from responsibility as publishers. And I think the, the third thing, which is part of Section 61 of the Human Rights Act, is the impact upon particular communities. Now, we had a cartoon um, that was subject to a case taken by Louisa Wall, and the judge ruled that the impact was the element. So the, the cartoon was ruled as being offensive, but then um, the, the court, uh, the, the, the judge didn't accept that uh, the impact had been sufficiently established. Um, and I think we've got to have a discussion because I agree with Arama, we need to educate as well as regulate, but we've got to have a discussion about the impacts of hate speech. And if I could just um, say two things on this account, 
I think many of us, because we're not targets of hate speech, do not realize it's corrosive and debilitating effect on those people targeted. So we need to raise the voice of the, the people that are targeted by hate speech. But in this context, I think there's a role for people like myself of Pākehā talking to Pākehā. You know, I, I don't think we should we should say to to um, minority ethnic and uh, religious communities or indigenous communities that it is simply their role to to contest and um, argue with against what are very often very powerful figures or very powerful institutions. So this is where I see my role as a Pākehā talking to other Pākehā um, to to talk to them about these very corrosive effects. And I just think that uh, hate speech, which has escalated significantly around the world and in New Zealand, and the 15th of March was that moment when we should have understood that um, that hate speech is is incredibly destructive um, in this case, in a physical sense, but it's destructive in so many ways that we need to understand that hate speech has escalated significantly in the last five years because of online. Now, I, w- I want to just finish on this, Chris. I think that we, we need to be careful because you know we've seen online activism around the Black Lives Matter, and, and that's been really a very powerful um, movement and debate, um, but we also need to acknowledge that hate speech is now a significant problem for a society like New Zealand that we cannot let continue in the way that it is at the moment. And I hardly agree with that for my own account, Paul. Gilded, you've been the target of some of this hate speech based on what you were saying earlier. Um, whose responsibility is it? Paul was talking about the need for Pākehā to talk to other Pākehā. Whose responsibility is it to push back against um, this kind of online hate speech, um, putting down people of other backgrounds, other religious beliefs often as well. Uh, we mentioned Islamophobia before. Whose responsibility is it? Because at, at a time of an overwhelming national crisis like the pandemic, everybody is looking to the government, but there's so much and only so much that the government can do. So who should kind of carry a torch for this? I'd, I'd actually point the finger right back at government in this particular instance, and I'll explain why. Um, you know, I think, firstly, I just want to um, just just pick up just something earlier that um, Paul was talking about in terms of the different, I guess, how different groups have, you know, had their fair share of racism and whatnot. Uh, I think the common team here and the elephant in the room is white supremacy. That's what it boils down to. Um, when our history is taught in a Eurocentric manner and we're not taught about things like the treaty in the bicultural context and how my refugees are all included as part of that um, is, is white supremacy. Um, you know, and I think it's important uh, to acknowledge that for what it is, because I think we have a problem sometimes in actually saying it for um, what it is. And I just wanted to quickly just say that. Um, I want to also just kind of like, I guess Matt was talking earlier about how, uh, you know, we're now become more openly talking about racism and whatnot. Um, and, and since March 15th and things like that, I actually, I actually think not a lot has, you know, changed since then. And, and in fact, you know, yes, there may have been some discussions, but, you know, we're seeing that rise of online hate more so than ever before. NetSafe recorded uh, just within the months after Christchurch that there was a 50% increase uh, of hate crime directed towards Muslims. Um, I myself have obviously um, been on the experience in hand of that as, as somebody who has had to um, step up, you know, and, um, and display public leadership and things like that. And, and, and this is always something that always comes with when you put yourself in a public space, but you come from minority backgrounds, it's much higher and the statistics goes to show that. And especially if you are a woman of color. So imagine if I was a female, the amount of more hate I would have got. So uh, it's really, really a big, big issue. Not a lot has changed. And I actually want to point the finger right back at the government because listen, we need political will on this. We need political, we're still waiting on the hate law speeches, uh, hate law uh, legislation reviews that we were promised months ago. Why isn't anybody talking about that? 
you know, when Christchurch happened, everybody came out and said they are us and gave us flowers and everything like that. It's still not stopping this racism, you know, that it's still increasing. It seems to be getting worse. Bigots seem to be more emboldened than ever before. Um, and, and look, the, the, we need political will um, to get these changes across the line. I think the issues around education and, and stuff like that is really important too. I'd also, um, I think we also need to look at the way in which we interpret these legal um, frameworks and things like that. You know, uh, Paul was talking about meeting that, that threshold of, of, of having intent. Um, that is such a subjective thing in the sense that it can be open to interpretation, you know? Something, so I have had situations where I've received very clearly threatening messages of nature and I've reported it to the police. Um, you know, things like, hey, you go organize another Black Lives Matter protest and you're gonna have some trouble coming your way. I mean, like, if that isn't threatening, I don't know what is, do you know? And, um, I, 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 and to be told that that is just merely the basis of somebody else's personal opinion, that is a slap in the face and that in itself is a product of institutional racism. And I'll explain why. I understand that the legal frameworks are limiting. You know, we're not stupid. That's why we're asking for political will in order for us to get these changes across the line. Um, but there's another issue. And I understand that we might not have the ability to prosecute and whatnot and, and, and you know, apply fines, et cetera, due to those limitations. But we cannot be telling people who are subject to these hate abuse that this is just a personal opinion. That in itself, when you have responses like that coming from the police, um, is really normalizing these sorts of behaviors. And, and the way in which the police themselves deal with hate speech is, is something that needs to be looked at. Um, I think it's, it's, it, it also, you know, because if we continue in that space, it's going to be less reluctant for us to be able to come out and report these things when we're put through such a horrible experience like that. And, and, and I, you know, I've heard similar stories of other people as well, and not just, you know, Muslims or whatever, even anti-Semitism and stuff like that, that have been directed at others. So um, I, I really think we really do need to look at our policy and legislative frameworks. Um, but at the same time, we need to critically reflect on actually how can we better equip um, our, I guess, law enforcement authorities to be able to respond and adequately deal with it. Um, if NetSafe is telling us this is harmful content and Facebook has, is removing these people that are sending us these messages because it violates their community standards, it's, it's quite shameful that Facebook and NetSafe are doing more to police online um, and hate speech than actually our law enforcement authorities. So, um, you know, and it's, it's crazy to think that this is happening and increasing off the back of March 15th. There's a lot of talk about how we as a nation have become so much better, um, you know, and, 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 and the response also globally that we are just, oh, we just really set the tone. I think all of that has really made it even more difficult for us to be able to even address these things. That's the reason why it's not on the political agenda. It's not on the radar because we ourselves have bought into that concept um, that, that we have responded really, really great and that actually we're doing great in so many areas. Um, but yeah, this area of online hate seriously needs to be tackled. And um, whoever is the next government really needs to make sure, regardless of whatever coalition situation they find themselves in, that they get this across the line because it's only a matter of time that rising online hate, you know, becomes offline hate and turns I, into- I agree with that. And thank you, Gulli. Ming, I have a, a question for you, if I may, from your um, very broad perspective that you have in your role as the Race Relations Commissioner. When you hear about all of these challenges, and of course they'll be in intimately familiar to you in your day-to-day -day work, looking at the next few years ahead, how optimistic are you about the prospect of change in New Zealand? We've talked, so several speakers have talked about the difficulty of achieving change. Are there, are there grounds for optimism or do we have to kind of grind our way forward at a very slow pace? Look, Chris, um, I'm forever an optimist. Um, I wouldn't be in this job if I wasn't an optimist. Um, I'm not here to be defeated. I don't want our country, our people to be defeated. I want them to be safe. And, um, you know, our 
our parents and our forefathers, they came to this country with great hope. And I too have great hope for our country. Um, just going back if, on one of, one of the other two things that have been uh, mentioned, um, the voice of racism actually came from about 200 odd uh, voices uh, from people that actually had received abuse and racism um, that were hurtful. And if you listen to it, um, and that's what we need to do is actually make people listen to it. And I'm systematically going around to um, organizations, ministries, to make sure that the chief executives actually give them time to actually listen to the voice of racism. And, and some people don't actually know that they've been saying these sort of things because they've been saying them for hundreds of well, many years. And um, in terms of the internet stuff, right, you know, the Bobby on the street, um, the policeman on the street back in the 70s and 80s, um, and even earlier, uh, was a great deterrent to crime. Um, so I was just thinking, you know, as someone actually posted hate crime on, or hate speech on the internet, why doesn't um, the government or the service provider says, right, we're going to close you up for one month. That is the punishment, right? And also um, a enforcement body to actually identify, well, they know who the ISP address is of all these people. They go and knock on the door and says, look, um, someone in your house is actually producing hate stuff in your household and they need to stop it. Once they actually caught out I'm sure that a lot of it will actually stop. It's only because people can get away with it at the present time and they've not been called out and they've been coward, brave warriors in their own homes doing these sort of things. So there's some practical steps that um, if I had the power, um, I would do. But we'll continue to um, lobby with great optimism that hopefully uh, more particularly our politicians will actually make the rules actually stronger. Um, you know, the, uh, in terms of um, the hate speech crime and the, the threshold itself, I mean, once upon a time, we used to burn women that were witches and chop people's heads off, um, beat people with whips and all that sort of stuff. Well, that doesn't happen now. Then as time goes on, there's actually less tolerance of that stuff. And, and I don't know why the thresholds aren't actually a little bit lower, or at least have an opportunity to actually provide some um, muscle and not with bus ticket stuff to actually be a little bit more punitive and create a little bit of fear in people that actually create these sort of things. As someone who studies persuasion amongst other things, I do know that fear can work as an appeal, as a persuasive appeal. Uh, but Arama, I wanted to ask you, if I may, given all that we've seen both very currently and for decades in the past about discrimination to do with Māori and Pacifica, how optimistic are you that we can achieve change? Because I think you were one of the ones who earlier talked about the challenge of actually moving the proverbial needle, getting something achieved. So, so how, how, how positive are you feeling about the prospects of, of change? Um, yeah, it is, it is difficult sometimes to remain hopeful, um, but I tend to try to remind myself of, of the struggles that my ancestors um, prevailed through. Um, some of the movements that I find really exciting at the moment are uh, movements to see the recognition of Tangata Moana um, and their place in this region of the world, um, given the appropriate uh, recognition that, that it deserves. Um, uh, I see a lot of progress being made with um, Māori and migrants of colour um, working together so anti-racists realizing that tenoranga tiratanga is an essential part of anti-racism in, in a settler colonial context and maori mm. seeing that um, the discrimination of other people of color um, is intimately tied to um, 
to colonization um, and the displacement of people from elsewhere uh, is why many people are moving to Aotearoa or even just unfair relationships that are established between Western nations and others um, being a big part of the reason why we have people wanting to, to to migrate to Aotearoa. So seeing those connections between imperialism and colonialism, um, forming solidarity and, and moving our agendas forward together in a way that is of mutual benefit, um, mm. I think are points where we can, um, yeah, we can create change and we can look at our own histories here in Aotearoa of how we've achieved um, incremental, um, slow revolutions. Just on a personal note, one of the things that's been transformative for me has been connecting with a community of African migrants um, in Onihanga. And uh, I just love hanging out with them because of their energy and vitality. But many of them have come out of those um, environments that you talk about, Anima, which have been greatly shaped and mostly not for the better by the legacy of colonialism. But um, Paul, could I put the same question to you from your overarching perspective, looking as you do in great detail at the makeup of New Zealand society and the trends that we're experiencing and, and perhaps also anticipating, what grounds for optimism do you see or do you see grounds for optimism? Um, I am by nature an optimistic person. And I think working in this area and for some time as I've done, I think you've got to retain a degree of optimism. Otherwise it would just um, mean that you give up. So uh, echoing Arama's point, I think if I look back, I, I first began working with the the Ming's office or um, his, the, the, the prior office, the office of the Race Relations Conciliator, as it was then in the 1970s. And I think there have been gains over those years, a much more, um, uh, a much wider recognition of the Tiriti or Waitangi, for example. Now, this is a journey that's, it's never going to, you're never going to arrive at a particular year and place and say it's completed. So I, I think it's an ongoing journey. And I, I, I look at the, some of the community initiatives, the, some of the initiatives amongst iwi, for example. Um, I look at um, the inclusive Aotearoa Collective, Anjam Raman and the others, and, 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 and their work towards um, inclusivity and anti-discrimination. And I'm heartened by all of that. So on the whole, I think that we are beginning to put some of the elements together. However, I think there are some enormously um, big holes in what we've done. We've talked about institutional racism. I think that I think that the the, the cultural diversity of New Zealand and what that means in a bicultural situation, I think, is a incomplete conversation. Um, leadership, I think, uh, Gulid mentioned leadership. You know, we do need that leadership. And and so I think, and all of this, you know, there come moments like that like that moment on the 15th of March in 2019, when you think all the things that I've seen are done in terms of communities um, has really um, been set back in a very violent um, way. A and and I, wrote, I wrote in the, in the hours after that about the end of our innocence around white supremacy. You know, somehow we were exempt from these white supremacist and white supremacist terrorism around the world. Well, we weren't, of course. So that, that was a moment that you 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 might despair, and you should do something about it. Um, but I think that we need to support each other. We need to um, have the confidence to to hand power to others, and we need the confidence to say that some of the things it's not a zero sum game. So some of the things that we see developing, which might be to to Adam's point about tēnā rangatiratanga, that is not taking away anything from somebody else. It's actually something that, that is of benefit to all of us. Mm. And we just need to have those courageous conversations, to use one of the slogans of our time. A good phrase, courageous conversations. Um, Can I just... Please. In terms of that question, because it, it's a really interesting one. Um, and, you know, like, like Adama and like Paul, um, 
you have to maintain a little bit of um, optimism and be optimistic and, you know, hold on to that. Like, otherwise, we'd not be able to do the work that we're doing. But if I may be honest, um, and, and, and this is the cynical side of me. Cynical because it's a coping mechanism when it comes to this. But um, I am actually not as hopeful. Um, and I think, you know, yes, we've seen a lot of work um, that has happened. You know, people like myself, Andrew, um, others uh, are now, you know, have a, a voice platform to be able to speak up. Um, but look, we're tired. We're, we're tired. We're tired of constantly having to clean up other people's racism problem. Um, and it's exhausting. It's, 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 this is not sustainable. A lot of us have, you know, this is not our full-time jobs, okay? Why, why it's just, it's, it's, and, and also not just that, it's, it seems like with all of this increase and everything like that, um, you know, I just, for me, people are actually silent when it really matters, when it really matters. And, you know, and, and this question has been raised in the chat and I can see that in terms of what, what Pakia can do and all of that, you know, and I guess the one thing that I just really want from people, you know, Pakia and others that don't experience racism is just unconditional allyship. And what I mean by that is we need you at all times, especially when it matters, because when we talk about things like racism and discrimination, we get a lot of backlash. It's real out here. And at those times, we notice that silence. Um, for example, what's happening right now at Waikato, uh, let's just take that into account. The broader silence from not just wider society, but even the academic community in itself, is, 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 is we're noticing that. And, and we need to be able to, um, you know, I guess, you know, for Pakia to be able to lift up their game in, in, in being, you know, unconditional allies when the going gets tough to be there when all the hate and the abuse and the backlash comes in. Um, but like, again, like, you know, actions speak louder than words. Um, I feel like we've been courageous for so long and I don't know how further courageous we can go if being courageous uh, means that you are a, you know, world renowned and, you know, one of the most cited indigenous scholars and yet you, your contract is not renewed because you raised issues of systemic racism, then I, I don't know if, 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 if it's even safe to be courageous anymore, to be honest, mm. the way we're heading in. And I think we just need to seriously reflect on that, to be honest, and, and not sugarcoat it and actually, you know, have a serious conversation about this. What comes to my mind is a um, set of sayings that was made by a German pastor after World War II who talked about how the authorities came for the Jews, they came for the Catholics, they came for different groups in society. And then he said, finally, they came for me, but there was no one left to help me. And it was all about how um, people stayed silent when they came for the Jews, when they came for other groups. Your point about silence is, I think, a very well-made one. I'm conscious that, um, technically speaking, our time is up, but I wanted to pose uh, uh, one final question, if I may, because I think we have a little bit of leeway. We've talked about inclusion and wanting to be an inclusive society. And yet, Arama, you mentioned the situation in the US right now where just this morning, a colleague there was talking about how divided the country is. How do we promote inclusion and avoid the fate of nations where divisions seem to be deepening, if anything, um, and becoming those divisions prompting more and more violence and indeed hate speech as we've talked about before. Um, Paul, could you comment on that? Yes, I think we need, I mean, we've, we've talked about leadership and I think leadership's important. It, it, it begins a conversation and it sets a tone. I think we need to talk about the government, the state being willing to consider new options. So one of my, one of my complaints in this new book is the lack of policy innovation and courage. So the state needs to look at it, what it itself does. So it needs to be 
it needs to have an opportunity to critique and, and review itself in, in honest ways, and then of delivering to the people that it represents. I think our political systems, um, and you know, I, I, the current um, election campaign is driving me crazy because of the things that are not being said. Hmm. And, and you know, they range, and, and, and there's a whole lot of things that are, are not going to be said because of offending a voting community that you want to that you want their support of. I think the private sector. Um, we often, and Gulid's reminded us today about the, the significance of the state, and, and, and you've heard me talk about that, but, but we're talking about a, um, we're a capitalist society, we're part of international capitalism, a new sort of globalism, and, and really we need, um, we need those, that private sector to be accountable as well to, to and I've just finished, um, I'm a diversity judge, and I've just finished visiting organizations, both public and private, in terms of this year's diversity awards. There's some fantastic stuff going on. We often don't hear enough of the, about that, but I'm also aware that that fantastic stuff is probably outweighed by the, the mediocre and the, and the other um, activities, which are not inclusive, which do not promote inclusivity and do not recognize um, tangata penewa. Um, and then I think the, the institution, how we actually have these conversations, Chris. So, uh, you know, um, congratulations to those who've organized tonight. It, it, it's fantastic. But, but when you think about the opportunities that we have for having these sorts of conversations, they're actually few and far between. They're very often filtered. They're very often constrained. I'm a, I'm a you know, I appear quite a bit on the, on the media. And, and if you can't convey what you want to convey in two or three sentences, then they're not really interested in you. And, and these are complex issues. You can't convey them in two or three sentences. So that long form journalism, which is reflective, which is, um, which is informed by evidence, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's not enough in my view of that. And there's not enough opportunity for us to have conversations. So if we were on a, a marae and, and, and these are the issues that we would, we would be talking about, then, you know, that it would provide everybody with a voice and it would mean that those voices, you know, there needs to be some sort of resolution uh, or some sort of way of letting people depart from the marae, feeling as though something had been resolved and not, are not going away feeling frustrated. So the, 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 the opportunities for really having these conversations, I think, are, are often limited. And I, I want to acknowledge Ming and the, the Voices of Racism campaign. That's, that's great. But, but it's very often not a dialogue, or if it's a dialogue, it's very often people shouting. It's, it's what Simon Wilson says, you know, people argue for the right to, to, to be heard, but they never really want to argue particularly strongly for the right to listen. So it, it, we shout at one another, particularly online, and, and I just find that very, very deeply frustrating. Sadly, Paul. As someone who's written on um, human attention spans and what's happening to them, uh, depending on who you listen to, in a digital environment, the average human attention span is about eight seconds. I, as a teacher, I work on the assumption that students, and this is not putting students down, that their attention span is about the length of two music videos. And so the ability that um, many people have to direct their attentional resources to significant issues of the sort that you've been raising can be pretty limited. Gullit, I wanted to ask you, please, what, from your perspective, can we do to resist the kind of divisive tendencies that we see so starkly portrayed elsewhere? Um, in, in, in terms of... Uh some of the other stuff that's happening overseas and how we Indeed. can prevent it from New Zealand? Well, within our own society, we, we, we say that we have a value of inclusiveness. You know, they are us, was the Prime Minister saying when, when March 15 came. How do we promote that and avoid the fate of, of a country such as the US where the divisions seem to be getting ever deeper on a daily basis? Yeah, 
And, and I would say that the divisions are also um, getting ever deeper as well here on an ever daily basis in New Zealand. Um, see, the thing is, we need to look at ourselves in the mirror before we can start pointing. Um, we know what has happened in America is bad. Um, it's, it's, it's not bad. It's actually horrendous. It's, it's a living mm. nightmare. See it all unfold in front of our eyes. Um, that partly is what has led to, I guess, a sense of complacency that has paved the way for uh, terrorist white supremacists to live amongst us, um, to go completely under the radar, to commit the atrocities that he has done. Um, so I myself, and I know many others, are worried about, I guess, the possibility of such a thing occurring again. Um, I don't think enough has been done to make mm. us shouldn't be thinking that way. So look, what I would say is rather than looking at what is happening globally, um, let's already look at the way in which it's already manifesting here on our shores. Now, the police have always wanted to arm themselves and we must be able to speak out about this, not just for Maori, but also for us as migrants and refugees. Um, you know, they don't tell us, I guess, you know, in terms of statistics, when it comes to us as black people, as, you know, relatively new phenomenal migration in terms of what the statistics are and when it comes to criminal justice outcomes and stuff like that, because, you know, we're a small community, et cetera, whatnot, privacy. But we know that from experience and we know in the way in which anti-black racism operates all across the world um, and what we're seeing and the trends in settler colonial states that, we will be the next on the chopping blocks. And we need to stay alert. We need to stay alert. The way that racism works and operates is that it's meant to divide and conquer. And I'll explain why. I'll put it into context. When Christchurch had happened, several months later, the police came out and they came up with a proposal to arm um, you know, the police in brown communities, not white, white, white supremacist hotbed areas, okay? In brown majority. I don't know. <laughs> which was just, it was not because they're invoking the sense of fear that Muslims have right now as a result of this to stir that division within us as oppressed people. That in itself, we need to call that out. The day after the sentencing, uh, the police commissioner came out and this was reported um, you know, by media that the police are seeking more powers. Now they didn't say they're seeking more powers to monitor and, you know, I guess, uh, stop white supremacist violent extremism. They just said more powers. We know that with more powers, that means more Maori people arrested, more Pacifica arrested. And guess who's next on the chopping block? Us. We're not off that list. So um, what I'm saying is we can't be complacent. We need to stay alert. We need to recognize the problems that we have here in our own backyard, how it's manifesting, how these are playing out. This is all, everybody that just wants to, I guess, you know, these comparisons actually aren't useful. They're not helpful at all. Um, we have a completely different context, a different um, history that needs to be acknowledged, the way in which it plays out um, and so forth. And, 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 and I would say that actually we're seeing what is happening all across the world, but it can also happen here in New Zealand. Um, people were surprised that what happened in Christchurch, uh, many of us were not, we were shocked at the scale in which it had happened there. So I don't think anybody should really be surprised by what I have to say about that. Thank you, Gulid. Appreciate you, your well-made points. Um, Arama, can I go to you for another comment and then I'd like to wrap up with uh, Ming's thoughts. Taking, taking on board Gulli's point about the, the utility or otherwise of making comparisons, what can we do to ensure to the extent that we can that we uphold the values of being an inclusive society and resist those tendencies, those groups even, that would promote division? Yeah, sometimes I think it's... Um... It might even be a little optimistic to be framing a question in that way. Um, we really do not have an inclusive society. There are many people who never feel safe in Aotearoa, no matter where they go. Um, and the idea that we can just, you know, tinker around the edges of our society to make it warm and fuzzy and inclusive 
I think is is missing the extent of the problem that exists in Aotearoa. Mm. Um, some people may be watching this and wondering if racism really exists in Aotearoa. To those people, I would say that you are woefully and willfully ignorant. Um, people of colour have been expressing the experiences of racism that they face in Aotearoa forever, <laughs> since the country was established. And if you haven't picked up that message yet, it's because you're ignoring it willfully. Um, so sometimes it's less about for me um, trying to create a warm and fuzzy inclusive environment and it's a, just about protecting myself and others who who are trying to to speak about racism openly who are trying to challenge um, institutional racism um, sometimes we just need to look after each other um, and sometimes um, park here need to get out of the way to let us do that right thank you for that Ming, could I ask for a final thought from you? Yeah, no, sure. Thank you, Chris. Um, look, um, I think um, if we work with the positive, and the positive that I see um, are in the business world. Mm. You can't be really discriminant and racist as a uh, a business company dealing with other people, otherwise you may not actually have any customers. Um, I'm, I'm encouraged by the number of mixed marriages in New Zealand, where once upon a time it was actually frowned upon. And so I'm hoping that through the unionship um, of um, people being made in the bedrooms, is going to um, create a more understanding society going into the future. I'm encouraged by the, um, the food that we actually eat and that we consume. Um, I remember a long time ago when some of our soldiers, I was working in the veggie shop and they used to come and say, well, we don't like the Japanese. And, but you know, now their children and their grandchildren are eating sushi. And so through food, economics, um, I'm, still, I'm still not impressed with the uh, current education system. Um, one of the biggest things is that we're still trying to create a white country um, because we're not allowing and enforcing um, Māori to be actually taught compulsorily at schools. Um, I myself am a product of um, learning Māori myself. And I could say, if that was me and how I see the world view of many cultures, and more particularly Māori in New Zealand, I'm sure that it will be a bit better. Thank I'm you sure so much for that, man. Better. Yeah. And we so I'm, I'm, there's a lot of work to be done, and we've got to continue to lobby um, and to not only lobby, but to actually put our, our thoughts into action, no matter how, how big this problem is, that if we can actually change one mind in the workplace and call it out, support them, um, educate them, I think we can go a long way. But there's a big job to do, and I just want to acknowledge um, the uh, Pacific Pearl and Yasa for organising our forum today and for all of our uh, participants and you, Chris, for being our um, facilitator. It's an awesome um, opportunity to express. And the one thing good about Zoom is that it's all taped uh, for future, um, uh, future knowledge, uh, for future viewing, where it is in, if, if it was in a hall, it would have been gone, dusted and finished. <laughs> and so I'm sure that we've got thousands more people participating tonight. And thank you to you, Yasser. Well, thank you. This is, I think, the time when I warmly thank each of you, Arama, Ming, yourself, Guled, Paul. It's been my privilege to um, help host this, this forum. And I want to echo, Ming, your, your commendation of the Pearl of the Islands Foundation for conceptualizing and uh, making happen this event tonight. Uh, we obviously have been just dipping our um, toes in a very large ocean. There's much, much, much more that we could say. And as we've discussed tonight, much, much more that needs to be done. But I value, and I'm sure all of those listening, value the points that you've made.
thank you again for doing it. And to those who are watching on YouTube, this is the time when we wrap that up and uh, thank you for joining us in our forum tonight.